Um, so my name is Claire Fitzgerald. I'm a research fellow here at the Government Outcomes Lab, and I have the pleasure of chairing this, our first plenary session of the conference. Um, so we're going to actually, I suppose, delve into some of the fruits of the scientific method in this space, right? Understanding the sort of evidence and experience to date of impact bonds throughout the world. And we've got four great presentations that we're going to hear today. Um, the first is from Emily gustafson Wright. She is at the Global Economy and Development at Brookings Institutions. She'll be followed by James Williams from York University, uh, James Ronicle from Acorus, and then Alison Bukhari from uh, Educate Girls. And so... Um, the way that the session is structured is we'll do presentations. Everyone will have a chance to speak. I'll then ask for any clarifying questions that you all might have. So these are short, sort of just have a very immediate, maybe a sentence long response. Anything more substantive, we'll, we'll hold for towards uh, the end of the session. So we'll open it back up to sort of have a broader discussion about some of the themes that have been brought up. So um, with that, I will pass it over to you, Emily. All right, good morning. It's wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues. Thank you to the Go Lab for inviting me here. I'm really looking forward to the next two days. Looks to be a fantastic uh, conference. Uh, so I have the task, small task, of um, talking to you about the landscape of all of the impact bonds in the world. Um, so where are we today? So March next year will mark uh, 10 years since the launch of the Peterborough SIB. Um, and at Brookings, we have been researching and building our global impact bonds database uh, for the last five years. And a lot has happened uh, during this time. So as of this month, uh, we are counting 166 impact bonds across 30 countries. Uh, the majority of those are in high income countries. Um, in fact, only 15 are in developing countries, uh, nine of which are development impact bonds, and six which are social impact bonds, or SIBs. The majority of impact bonds in high-income countries are in the UK and the US, followed by uh, the Netherlands and Australia. Um, the majority of impact bonds are in the employment and social welfare sectors, um, and um, in addition to those impact bonds, we also are following about 50 impact bonds that are in design um, across, uh, across the world, as well as several outcome funds uh, for particular sectors such as education and health. Um, so some other numbers about impact bonds. Um, about over 400 million US dollars have been invested in uh, total upfront capital. That's probably an underestimate as there is some missing data. Also some impact bonds recycle capital back into the deal so there's actually more invested uh, over time. The average upfront capital commitment um, is about 3 million. Um, and then in terms of beneficiaries, the ad average number is about 13,000 beneficiaries, um, but about half of impact bonds are serving fewer than 480 individuals. So um, still pretty small. And then the average contract duration of the impact bonds is about um, 51 months. So we often get the question, have impact bonds paid returns? Uh, we don't actually think that that's the most important question. Obviously, um, how the beneficiaries are faring in these impact bonds is the most important question. Um, but I thought we'd get this one out of the way since we often are asked. Um, so um, of the 166 impact bonds that have been contracted globally, 49 have reached the end of the contract period. Of those 24 paid back principal plus returns, one paid back principal only, five have made some repayment, one made no repayment, uh, which is the Rikers Island impact bond uh, in the United States. Five have ongoing evaluation still, and then for 13 of those, um, the data is not yet public. So when we started uh, our research um, and we published our first report, uh, we established what we call the 10 common claims. This is what the literature was saying about what impact bonds could achieve. Um, at the time, we examined the first five years of impact bonds, which was 38 impact bonds at the time. Um, and uh, we tested these claims um, across those impact bonds through um, 
uh, about 150 interviews of the impact bond uh, players um, and examining um, what the research said thus far. Um, and we've continued to analyze uh, these claims um, now through the 166 impact bonds that have been contracted. So the, the, these are the first six where we see that there was some demonstrated evidence, and I'll go into more detail now, um, and then um, these four where we find there to be some um, lacking evidence thus far. So, um, so claim uh, one, and just to say, you know, really this is a kind of what we're seeing on average. Uh, obviously, there's much more nuance to this. Each of these impact bonds, uh, you know, varies in their structure, in, you know, in the outcomes, in, you know, the individuals that are participating. Um, but uh, so I would say this is really, you know, kind of a story on average. Um, there's a lot more nuance. Um, but interestingly, on average, the story has really remained uh, much the same over time since we released our first report uh, five years ago. So the first claim, um, impact bonds invest in preventive services. Um, so we really are seeing um, on average that impact bonds are indeed investing in preventive services. Of course, the most preventive services that, um, that could be conducted are those that are focusing uh, on early childhood. So uh, for example, the development impact bond for maternal and newborn health in Rajasthan, India is, is really um, obviously a preventive intervention. Um, you know, other programs uh, focusing on um, family support to avoid out of home uh, care or out of home placement um, are also examples, is another example of um, preventive services. Um, but some impact bonds, I would say, are addressing things a little bit late in the game. So, for example, impact bonds that are serving um, homeless populations, obviously they're preventing them from worse outcomes later on, but um, if they had uh, received services earlier, um, preventing that, obviously, that would have been better. Um, so, uh, claims two and three. Impact bonds focus attention on outcomes and increase increased collaboration. So we really do find that impact bonds do seem to be focusing both uh, governments um, and service providers' attention on achievement of outcomes, shifting from the focus on inputs, um, and really are seeing examples of increased collaboration. So across government, across different service uh, providers, um, as well as across different layers and across public and private sector. So a really nice example of this um, is in the South Africa Youth Employment SIB, has a wide range of actors that are really working together, increasing actors um, after a year of services, um, and really a, a razor sharp focus on the outcomes within uh, the service provider. So claims four and five, uh, impact bonds drive performance management and monitoring and evaluation. So yes, so this is where we really think that impact bonds have an enormous potential and we are seeing evidence of service providers really improving their capacity around monitoring and evaluation and um, performance management. So collecting data, using the data to course adjust, figure out what's, wor what's working, what's not working, so that they can better serve the populations that they're serving. A really good example of this is, um, is the story about the Educate Girls Development Impact Bond, the first development impact bond in education, and you'll hear more um, about that from Allison on this panel. So claim six, impact bonds reduce government risk. Um, so I guess the first question is really what kind of risk? Generally, um, when um, I think the statement is made, it's really referring to the financial risk um, that uh, is possibly reduced for governments because they are paying only when outcomes are achieved. Um, and so, you know, this, this claim we used to have in the um, category of no, not something we were seeing yet. We moved it to the yes category when the Rikers Island Social Impact Bond, um, the intervention did not achieve um, the outcomes and the government didn't pay for outcomes not achieved. So that's a clear example of reducing the financial risk for government. Um, but um, with all of the other impact bonds uh, that have um, achieved outcomes and those that are in the works, um, you know, we really don't have a counterfactual. So we we can't say whether or not those outcomes would have been achieved 
um, in the absence of the, uh, of the impact bond, and therefore we can't really say how risky um, they are for government. Um, so, um, you know, there's some other, in some cases, the, the story is really more around kind of, um, you know, is this um, improving, increasing the chances of success um, in the delivery of social services rather than uh, reducing risk um, for government. Um, so claim seven is um, that impact bonds sustain impact. So to start, uh, we think it's still a little bit soon to say that on average. Um, we really haven't seen many cases of beneficiaries that have been followed after the impact bonds completion. Um, but there are some interesting examples where you could say, you know, some impact is being sustained or interesting kind of ripple effects of impact bonds. Uh, one could say, for example, in the state of Utah in the United States, um, the, uh, there, was, there were services provided for preschool education in Salt Lake County, and um, later on, there was legislation passed um, to expand preschool services to the entire state of Utah, which is a really interesting story. Um, and then, of course, there could be other impacts, which you could say are sustained impacts, such as the improvement of service provider um, capacity around performance management, et cetera, which I talked about earlier, which could impact many cohorts um, to come. So impact bonds crowd in additional private funding. Uh, this is a favorite of many. Um, and uh, what we generally, our, our view is that no, impact bonds do not crowd in additional private funding. And there's two key words there, additional and private. Private, first of all, the majority of um, funding thus far is philanthropic. We're, so we're not talking about commercial capital. Um, in some cases, even it's government capital, particularly in the UK. Um, but the other key point is the additional. So, you know, is, this, is there more capital coming to a particular sector or space? Um, and well, since the outcome funders are repaying those investors back, it's not necessarily additional um, capital. There may, however, be some new actors that are engaging in sectors or around interventions that they may not have been engaged in otherwise, which is also a very interesting story but still not necessarily additional private funding um, since the outcome funders are paying them back. So claim nine, impact bonds support experimental interventions. So on average, we would say that most of the service providers really have quite a bit of evidence behind them. Um, so you know, for some of them, already randomized controlled trials have been conducted, and this gives the investors really quite some assurance that uh, it's likely that outcomes will be achieved. Um, and um, you know, there, are, there are some that are a bit more experimental, but on average, we're really not seeing that. Um, but an interesting aspect is that because of the upfront risk capital being provided to service providers and, um, and the flexibility to do what they need to do, um, there is um, the ability to sort of innovate um, and, uh, like I said, figure out what's working, what's not working, and course adjust along the way. So that can lead to innovation. But it's not necessarily, you know, impact bonds aren't necessarily supporting interventions that don't have any evidence behind them, per se, on average. Um, and then claim 10, uh, impact bonds can achieve outcomes at scale. Um, I guess it depends on your definition of scale, but as I mentioned, the majority of impact bonds really are quite small. Um, and so, um, you know, so they're not really achieving at scale. There are some impact bonds that are larger, in particular in developing countries actually, um, where obviously the problems are, can be quite outsized. In a country like India, um, the Utkrish Development Impact Bond for newborn and maternal health um, is meant to reach 600,000 um, mothers and um, their babies. Um, and the Quality Education India Dib um, was aiming, targeting 300,000 uh, um, children. So, and then there's some interesting examples uh, in the UK and the Netherlands of projects that are expanding um, interventions that were used in an impact bond, then used in additional impact bonds in the future, or um, or scaled in other ways um, through government. Uh, 
So that's really the Cliff Notes version of what we have seen thus far uh, in the world of impact bonds. Um, there's obviously so much more that, uh, that we have learned. Um, you know, I think that uh, it's important to look forward. There's a really interesting sort of road ahead and um, everyone who's in this room doing the research, you know, are critical to that learning process and all of the practitioners, obviously, who are doing the hard work on the ground. So we really look forward to learning more from all of you and, um, and sharing your knowledge um, with, um, with the world. So thank you. So I'll ask quickly for any clarifying questions for Emily. So these are short questions, substantive ones come at the end. If not, I'll pass it over to you, James. Great, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, to have the opportunity to present in this conference and hopefully to contribute to some of the uh, really interesting conversations that I think we'll be having over the next couple of days. Thank you. So what I would like to do today is to discuss some of the findings from a research study that I've been leading over the last three years. Uh, the tricky part is that the study spanned three different countries, Canada, the US, and UK. It's informed by thousands of pages of documents and over 200 interviews. So the challenge for me is how to condense all of this information down into a 10 to 12 minute presentation. Uh, given that the full results of the study are available uh, through a research report which came out in May and it can be accessed through the website listed at the bottom of the slide, what I would, thought I would do is highlight a couple of key conclusions or lessons that I think speak specifically to the evolution and future of impact bonds and outcomes contracts. So with this in mind, let me begin by providing just a very, very quick overview of the research study. So the study began in the spring of 2016, wrapped up just this past May. And it was based on a couple of key objectives. The first was to examine the funding challenges faced by social service nonprofits working in five key policy areas, those being education, employment, child welfare, homelessness, and criminal justice, areas that will be familiar to all of you. The second objective was to explore the viability of some of the new outcomes-based funding models, primarily SIBs and Pay for Success as a way to address those challenges. And finally, I wanted to compare the challenges and some of the new models across Canada, the US, and UK. So it was kind of explicitly and intentionally comparative in nature. In terms of methods, there were two primary methods. Uh, the first was documentary research. Um, including an exhaustive review of all of the available literature um, on social impact bonds, pay for success, outcomes-based contracts. And the second was semi-structured interviews. And this is kind of the key, most important part of the study. And I interviewed individuals selected from a number of key groups, government providers, investors, which included trusts and foundations, and SIB specialists, a very kind of broad, somewhat amorphous group, but includes intermediaries, advisors, fund managers, some of the individuals working most directly in the space. Um, in total, I conducted 196 uh, semi-structured confidential interviews. 54 of the interviews were in Canada, primarily in Toronto. Um, 68 were in the US, largely in Boston, where a lot of the intermediaries and advisory firms are based. I was actually fortunate enough to spend three months there in the fall of 2017. And then there are 74 interviews in the UK, the majority in London, um, where I was also based for a three month stint um, from January to April, 2018. So these conversations yielded five kind of key insights or lessons that I think and hope are relevant to our discussions at this conference. So lesson number one, despite growth in the number of projects, the number of countries that have been experimenting with SIBs, the overall rate of growth has been slower than expected, with SIB specialists encountering a variety of different challenges, barriers, and frustrations in their efforts to develop and scale the market. So going into the study, my assumption was that those working in the SIB space would be very enthusiastic. They would have a very positive, very optimistic view of the market. What I discovered in all three countries was quite different, kind of a sense of frustration that things had not progressed quickly enough. Um, a lingering feeling of uncertainty, uh, and in some cases, actually downright skepticism about the future of SIPs. So just a couple of kind of illustrative quotes. Uh, the first is from a provider based in the UK who's been involved in a number of SIPs. 
When I first started in social investment early in 2011, I wouldn't have quite put it as boldly as this, but I could see a social impact bond in every corner. But actually now, I don't think it'll happen, and I think the bubble has burst already. I think this will fizzle out. Uh, the second from a SIB specialist, UK-based SIB specialist. I'm not at all sure what the future is. There are some people thinking it will just run straight into the sand as soon as government takes away subsidy, referring primarily to the outcomes funds here. We have not and never have got to the point where commissioners leap out of bed in the morning and say, I know, I should do one of those SIB things. <laughs> and lastly, from the US, uh, the future of pay for success is very uncertain. So that leads me into lesson number two, which is, well, the explanations for these struggles vary across Canada, the US, and UK, and are discussed in a lot more detail in the actual report itself. The fundamental challenge in all three countries has been aligning the interests of government, investors, and providers around a common value proposition. And I think it's important to note that this is kind of a systemic challenge, so it's not easily overcome. So based on the first generation of projects, I think it's pretty clear that the three parties approach these transactions with very different interests and expectations in hand. Governments are interested in near-term cost savings and transferring all or most of the risk to investors. Investors are seeking to safeguard their principal and limit their risk exposure. And the relatively few providers that have the capacity to participate in these deals are looking for long-term flexible funding without onerous terms and conditions. So here I have a quote which I think really nicely captures kinds of some of these tensions um, and the fact that individuals are often working at cross purposes. So the individual states, in social investment, everybody's trying to find a deal. So the local authority have to reduce future spend, but its ultimate focus is always on how much it can save in year because that's the way local authorities fi or local finance departments think. The investor wants to get its 6% return and improve on it if it can. And the provider wants to provide really good services but not take on too, financial ri too much financial risk. So I'm not sure how honest we are in the market about talking about those different perspectives and trying to come up with deal structures that work for everybody. I think the risk is that by not having these very honest conversations, everybody ends up sort of trying to do the very best they can for their own organization. And as a result, the structure fails. Lesson three, in response to these struggles, and the slow growth of the market, SIB specialists, particularly intermediaries, advisory firms, have broadened their focus, started to introduce new contracting structures, new products, new services, and have thus moved away from the original model, what could be described as this phenomenon of SIB drift. In the words of a senior member of the UK SIB space, what I worked out here pretty quickly is we couldn't live by SIB alone. We had to essentially use our learning from designing and implementing SIBs and go into a variety of other areas. So it kind of very nicely captures some of the pressures uh, and the evolution that has occurred um, as a result. So these innovations have taken a variety of different forms. In the UK, the fully intermediated model quickly gave way to rate cards and more straightforward kinds of working capital loans. The evolution of the space has been especially pronounced in the US, where some pay for success specialists have shifted their focus to government advisory work using data and contract management to improve the efficiency and outcomes of existing funding streams without having to engage private investors. Other US pay for success specialists have continued on the investment track, working to attract investors and develop new investment products. Recent innovations include, and there is actually a much longer list, I've just selected a couple of them. Innovations include US style rate cards, corporate payer models, social impact guarantees, career impact bonds, and impact securities. So thus, I think it's really important to keep in mind that SIBs are far from a singular coherent model. And those who continue to view SIBs through the lens of Peterborough, which includes some academics and some researchers, will only see a very small slice of the field while neglecting what in fact is a complex and dynamic marketplace. Lesson four, the future prospects of SIBs and pay for success in a market depend on how we define SIBs and pay for success, which may seem like an obvious, but it's actually a very important point. With broader and more flexible definitions allowing for a more optimistic view of the space. So if we define SIBs and pay for success in terms of, kind of the original idealized model and the development of individual bespoke transactions involving government, providers, investors, and intermediaries, the future of the space may indeed be quite limited 
likely confined to a relatively small niche market. However, SIBs and pay for success are defined much more broadly in terms of different forms of outcomes-based funding and financing reflecting the growth and evolution of the field, then the future may indeed be much brighter. This question of the future of the space emerged as one of the points and some of the feedback that I received on earlier drafts of the report. In particular, seven of my US respondents suggested that my characterization of SIBs as a niche market overlooked these recent innovations, which is a fair point. The following comment, I think, is brilliant and really nicely captures uh, this position. So the broad implementation of pay for success, this is from a pay for success specialist, is indicative of anything but a small niche market. The basic model is a platonic idea that has many variations in its manifestations in the world. The original unmodified model may work best in a few cases, but the underlying insight that paying for outcomes will enhance performance, accountability, and innovation is truer now than ever because we have validating experience and practice. We've moved from a theory to a practice whose demand continues to expand. However, I think this begs the question of the impact of these innovations and whether potential gains in market size and scale will help to produce better outcomes for marginalized and disadvantaged groups, which is really what we're all clearly most concerned with. So that leads me to the final lesson, lesson five. As the field moves towards different types of outcomes-based approaches, it really matters what we mean by outcomes and how these are defined and produced. While well, almost all projects, all models, all product, products use the language of outcomes, the actual performance metrics in many cases look like outputs. That is activity-based indicators like enrollments, program completions, and contact with services. Many projects also draw from what are described as soft outcomes, such as changes in attitudes and improved behavior. Collectively, these kinds of measures can be viewed as proxies, which uh, which are assumed to correlate based on the existing research and evidence base with longer term outcomes. However, with many projects lacking formal evaluations, rarely is any effort made to determine whether these correlations actually hold up and are sustained in practice and produce the desired results. The gap between outputs and outcomes is nicely illustrated by um, this following SIB specialist in reference to the use of distance traveled metrics, which are a feature of many rate cards, um, particularly in the UK context. So this is again is a UK SIB specialist. The more distance travel metrics that we have in place, the more they become the be all and the end all of service delivery. Instead, instead of genuinely sitting back and saying, well actually, well actually the outcome that everybody wants is this. Now it's gonna take us three years to get there. And how confident am I that spending all of my time focusing on delivering a maximum payment in relation to the short-term metric is ultimately the sort of work that would deliver in the long term. So all of this is to set, suggest that moving forward, we need to be really, really careful about how we define outcomes and spend more time thinking about whether the outcomes associated with these new approaches are actually contributing to meaningful social change. So just to conclude, the title of my talk today, the lead title, was Where Do We Go From Here? Unfortunately, I'm not sure that I have a clear, good answer to that question. Maybe I should have led with that and spared you all the suspense and now, ultimately, the disappointment. Uh, but what I think, or what I hope this research has revealed is that answering the question requires that we have a better understanding of the present and how much things have changed since the launch of Peterborough in March of 2010. The original vision of SIBs and social investment more broadly was to develop and catalyze new and innovative approaches to addressing critical social challenges. However, due to a range of influences, pressures, challenges, and constraints, we have ended up in a very different place, I think, where SIBs and pay for success are viewed more as policy tools and instruments of public sector reform, where the overriding focus is often on service efficiencies and cost savings, and where the, where a host of new instruments and services are producing outcomes, but not necessarily the kinds of outcomes that we may have been hoping for or expected. This disconnect between the original vision and the present reality is nicely captured by um, my last respondent that I have here today, um, an individual who has been involved with the UK SIB space since its inception. So they argue 
quote, when they were designed, SIBs had three things they were trying to do. One was be outcomes focused around beneficiaries, second, to reform commissioning, and third, that you would take the risk and innovate, and then the machinery of state would take that innovation and go, oh yeah, that works, and put it into policy and scale it. Those three things, gone. Now it's all about cost savings rather than outcomes. There's no machinery of state anymore, so that not a single of the SIBs that's been invested in has been taken up by the state and ruled out. And commissioning now is honestly a complete mess, and commissioning has taken a step backwards because now it's all about cost. And so the three fundamental drivers for SIBs have kind of been lost in the midst of time. And now they are really being used as an outsourcing commissioning tool to cut costs, basically. Um, and I should say also that this is an individual who is invested in, in a number of SIBs in the UK. Um, interestingly, these shifts in the SIB enterprise, these forms of SIB drift, have been largely overlooked in much of the research to date, especially the academic research, which remains focused on the original model and the view of SIBs as a new asset class, an opportunity for financiers to profit from social services. And yet they raise some critical questions as we look to the future of the space. Has the drive to grow and scale the market come at the expense of the quality of the outcomes and the impact being achieved? Has the drift towards rate cards, corporate payer models, and more scalable and standardized approaches left the space more vulnerable to the criticism that this is really about cost cutting, reducing the size of government and privatizing services? Many of these kinds of criticisms coming from the academic research community. And third, most critically, is there something of value that has been lost? Well, the original concept of the social impact bond, without question, certainly has its flaws. It represented an opportunity to develop new and innovative approaches to social programs, to foster different kinds of partnerships between philanthropy, providers, and government, and to raise the profile of social issues and leverage additional public funding. So with this in mind, rather than scaling up, should we be scaling back and returning to some of the original principles that animated Peterborough? Again, unfortunately, I don't have clear answers to these questions, but I honestly think that Asking them is critically important as we continue to think about the future of the space. Thank you. Any clarifying questions? Fab, I can't, I'm looking forward to everyone's brilliant ideas later. All right, James. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, James Ronicle. I'm an associate director at Acorus. We're an evaluation organization. We've been evaluating impact bonds for about five, six years. Evaluated about 40 to 45 now, most in the UK. Um, but I'm here to talk about a development impact bonds evaluation we were commissioned to undertake uh, last year. The, uh, we have three waves of research. The first wave was focused on the design and setup of these four dibs, and we published our report uh, a few weeks ago, uh, so I'm here to sort of give a, a summary. I will equally complain, like everyone else, that 10 minutes cannot do this justice, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Uh, so in terms of the four dibs that we focus on, this is a, a sort of broad summary. We have the um, ICRC Humanitarian Impact Bond, which is focusing on rehabilitation in uh, conflict zones. We've got the Quality Education India, which is focused on education outcomes in India. It's a follow-on from the Educate Girls Dib, which you'll hear about soon. Uh, the Village Enterprise uh, Poverty Graduation Dib, and the uh, Cameroon Cataract Bond, which is focusing on uh, cataract surgeries in Cameroon. Um, I would say these four dibs have one thing in common. They all have an external investor. Beyond that, I would say they have almost nothing in common. And I think it really builds on the point that James is saying, that when you look at it, actually, what is an impact bond? And there are many different ways that you can configure them and slice them, and they actually look very different. And in, and, and in these four dibs, which made our job slightly difficult, any which way you slice these, they're completely different in terms of what they're paying for. Some of these are definitely paying for outcomes. Some of these, I would say, are paying for performance rather than outcomes. Who are the funders? Some of these are governments, some of these are bilateral donors, some of these are foundations. Um, the scale of them is completely different. And also the um, capital guarantees, and they range here from some investors have 100% of their money at risk, some have 60% guaranteed, and the Cameroon cash rate bond I would describe more as a performance-based loan because 100% of the capital is guaranteed, as is 4% of the interest payments. So I think one really 
main findings that we found is, again, you need to imagine or see impact bonds as a sort of set of different principles that can be applied in different ways, but they're most definitely not a, a single instrument, and we really found that in these four dips. I'll skip over that. One of the things uh, that we were really focusing on is uh, what is the dib effect in these four dibs? And, and by that, we meant how is the sort of design, delivery, implementation affected by the fact that it's been commissioned through a development impact bond rather than through a different mechanism? And how we did this, we took, again, similar to Emily, some of the um, common claims around impact bonds, use some of the ones that Emily has. Um, and we looked mainly through qualitative research. We sort of tested whether stakeholders felt that these claims had been true and had, had been affected in these impact bonds. And we also had comparator sites to look at to what extent did these exist and to what extent did they not exist when very similar interventions were delivered not through an impact bond. And to what extent do people think that those differences are attributable to the impact bond. I would say that is not an easy thing to do. Um, and a fair degree of evaluator judgment has gone into this, but we did sort of validate this with the stakeholders we interviewed. Um, I'm just going to pick up some of what I think are the really the interesting things here. Number one is if you take away some of those red squares, um, most of what some of the claims are around impact bonds, we broadly found, particularly, I think, around the collaboration, around the focus on outcomes, around some of the transfer of risk, but, but we'll get into that. So I think it's quite interesting that despite the fact that these four impact bonds are completely different, and despite the fact that when you look across the world, they're completely different, actually, you do start to see some of those common effects. So there is even though you, you might change the model all the time, there are some fundamental aspects to it that seem to that have fairly similar effects in different applications. Below that core headline, though, I think there are some really interesting nuances when you look at these four impact bonds. Uh, some of what I'm about to say aligns with what Stefan said this morning. Uh, some of it doesn't, and I've spent the coffee morning trying to work out how I can contradict the uh, chief scientist of DIFID, and, and I think I have the answer. Um, <laughs> One of the things I think is really interesting, and it also builds on what Emily said, is the debate around does this bring additional financing into the development sector, or is this money that would have gone into the development sector anyway and is repurposed? And this is claim six. And I think what you'll find there is there's quite a different degree across these four dips. So ICRC, Humanitarian Impact Bond, this is a commercial insurance investor who's actually in the room, or one of them. Um, and this is money that, they, that, that they've, t this is a commercial investment that they would have put in a different insurance mechanism and they've put into this. So this is definitely money that would not have gone into the development sector that's now in there because of this impact bond. <coughs> the others, um, the... Uh, village Enterprise, these are the same donors that were donating to Village Enterprise anyway, and Village Enterprise went and asked them if they would invest in it. So this money probably would have gone to Village Enterprise or it would have gone to another organization, but it's gone in through investment. So that's not new money that would have gone into the sector. And I think this is, from an international development point, I think this is quite important because one of the big arguments around impact investing generally and impact bonds is we have a, I think, $4.5 trillion funding gap to achieve the sustainable development goals. Impact investing is one way to bring in additional money to the sector. And I think sometimes it exists, but, but, but a lot of the time it doesn't. And what I think is the interesting relationship is between that and number one and the transfer of financial risk. And what we saw is how is it that you have some commercial investors in here and, and not in others, and it's very much about the capital guarantees. And the ICRC humanitarian impact bond is the one that has 60% capital guarantees, and it's got private investment. The village enterprise one has no capital guarantees, all capital is at risk, and it has donors. So uh, there's a very, and this is what Stefan was saying, you're paying for risk. And so if you want additional money to come into the sector, you can't then expect all, them to take on all of that risk without paying huge returns at the same time. So it's a, to, uh, you can't sort of have it all. If you want new money into the sector, you also have to keep some of the risk. So there's a, it seems like there's a really key relationship between how much risk are you willing to transfer and who's going to invest in your impact bonds. The other thing that I found really interesting looking at this, and this slightly contradicts what Stefan was saying, um, was you need to think about what risk is being transferred and what, and what isn't, or what can be transferred and what can't. And you might be able to transfer financial risk, 
But there are other risks that not only don't get reduced for public sector, they actually increase. And the one that we definitely found, which Stefan didn't, um, was reputational risk. And actually, the fear of failure around designing an impact bond is very, is very, very high around, if I get this wrong um, and, I, and I massively overpay for something that could have been achieved anyway, or I get this completely wrong and actually this service completely falls over, which is actually a service I really want to, to exist, um, there's a huge amount of nervousness. And I think what we found in these four development impact bonds is a quite a large degree of risk averseness. And, quite, and that forced people then to, to not take risks. So some of these are some of the most established uh, service providers in this space. Some of these interventions have randomized control trials and pretty good evidence base behind them. So even though the financial risk was transferred, did that enable uh, donors to take more risks? I don't think it did because of that reputational risk and the fear. Um, how does that align with Stefan saying that um, people really like them uh, because of the because they have less reputational risk? I think because he was talking at a ministerial level, um, but he also said that civil servants are, I think, quote unquote, scared of getting bollocks for getting it wrong. And I think the reputational risk is there at the at the sort of civil servant level. I have two minutes. So the other, th four. oh, four, all oh, right. Well, three now. Three. OK, yeah. I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I'll slow down. Um, one of the other things we looked at was what are the, um, as, as James was saying, um, a large amount of impact bonds have been commissioned, a large amount have been attempted and not been commissioned. And what is it about those that get off the ground versus those that fail? What are the critical success factors? And we did some research in the UK with uh, Piru, the London School of Hygiene, around 20 that failed and five that launched, and what were the factors. And we developed a framework around that. And then we looked at the development impact bonds, and we also looked at some that failed, to look at, does that framework also work when you go outside of the UK and apply it to international development? And we found broadly it does, but there are other factors that you also need to think about as well. So these were, and thank you to Mara for giving me the acronym, um, the louder, it was loud in the UK, we changed it to louder for international development. So this is what we've seen are the sort of critical factors that you need. I've lost D actually, but uh, to get this launched. Um, collective leadership, so as, we, as James was saying, these things are time consuming, expensive, generally hard to get off the ground. You've got to have really committed leadership to really want this and to work through all the challenges that are gonna be faced. You've got to have really clear, measurable, uncontroversial outcomes that you can ideally price, which we talked about was difficult. And you've got a very a reasonable degree of confidence that your intervention is achieving. Is, those outcomes can be attributed to the intervention. You've got to have a shared understanding, again, much like Stefan was talking about, that you want to outsource, that this is a good mechanism to do it through. You've got to have that agreement. You've got to have data to be able to model what those outcomes are going to be, how much they're going to cost you. They were the four that we saw in the UK. What we also saw in international development is you've got to have a supportive ecosystem. And by that, we really mean a strong um, provider market. And why, do they, why are they quite popular in India? One of the views is because actually the service provider market is strong and you can do this there. Why have they been harder to do in some African countries? Because the provider market is less strong and it's much more difficult to, to commission these. And the final one is the regulatory framework. Um, there are all sorts of uh, legal, when you take this outside of the UK, all sorts of legal difficulties around what can you invest in, who can make profit, transferring money from one place to another. Um, in the uh, ICRC humanitarian impact bond, the Belgian king actually had to sign a waiver to enable them to, uh, to invest in this because the regulatory framework they had just prohibited this. So there are all sorts of challenges, but it's if you have a supportive regulatory framework, they're much easier to get off the ground. One minute, OK, wrap up. Um, so what do I think are some of the most interesting things that we've seen so far from this evaluation? The first one, as I said, is that I think you need to see impact bonds as a loose group of funding structures rather than a particular model. Secondly is, on a high level, there was a relatively consistent degree of dib effects and they're quite closely aligned to some of the sib effects we've seen in the uk so even when you put this in a completely different context it seems to have the same effects with some nuances 
Uh, and the third one, which I don't really have, uh, I'm back into the long open road analogy. I don't really have the answer to this yet. But how much are we looking at, both in our evaluation but here, impact bond effects, or how much are they novelty effects? And the fact that these are cool, um, these are new. And I think that has some positives around people are willing to spend a lot more time to try and get them off the ground than maybe they would do otherwise. But I think also that maybe has some negative effects on these around the fear, the reputational risk as well. So how much is this dip effect? How much of this is novelty effect? Uh, if you invite me back in two years after we've done our second wave of research, I might be able to answer that question, but not now. Thank you. Any clarifying questions for? Yeah. Go ahead. Can you introduce yourself as well? Yes, my name is Amel. I'm the CEO of the Education Outcomes Fund for Africa and the Middle East. Um, James, I have one question. You said from the successful ones, we've seen that <coughs> basically the outcomes were clear and they were, you could really attribute them one, let's say, you could attribute that the interventions, um, yeah. you could, fine. <laughs> Are you saying that none of the successful in terms of launched impact bonds have been where you knew the outcomes but actually didn't know what works and wanted to want to find out? Uh, good question. I No, what I mean is not necessarily are you confident those outcomes are going to be achieved. Are you confident that what you're measuring is linked to the service that you're funding? So those where it's really difficult to get, to get off the ground is where I have no confidence. I'm going to pay for these outcomes. I don't really have any confidence that this intervention is actually what it was that led to those outcomes. So it's not um, can those outcomes be achieved. It's can they actually be measured, and can I be confident that I am, am, I, paying, am I paying for what works, or am I paying for those outcomes, but actually it was something over here that funded them. So if you don't have that confidence, then they generally don't get launched. Any other clarifying? I see a hands back here. I think there's a mic coming to you behind you. Hello, hello. Um, Aziz Goumiri, researcher at uh, Sorbonne Business School. Uh, I wanted to, um, so Emily uh, gives us a right, uh, prove that most of. Can we hold just questions for James and then we'll open it up for more broader questions at the yeah, end. Yeah, it's session. for James, just ah, okay. exposing a result. Uh, she proved that most of the time uh, investors were paid back in uh, their uh, SIBs. And uh, when uh, we saw uh, the table uh, with uh, the amounts, we saw that when the foundings weren't uh, guaranteed, the uh, return on the invest was extremely huge. So how can we overcome this, um, I'd say, cost efficiency issue for next uh, SIPs? Because most of them succeed, but when it's not guaranteed, uh, they cost a lot. Do you get my question? <laughs> so, sorry, uh, how can, how you, can you rephrase the question? Reduce the, the return on invest, uh, the, the maximum repayment for SIBs if the risk is always that high that investors can lose everything. Do you see what I mean? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer this question. I, I think. The, the point I think I was trying to make was that there's, there's, there's a trade-off here between risk, risk and return. And the higher the risk in delivery, either you're going to be paying way more in returns or you're going to provide some guarantees to, to, to bring that down. So I think, I think the answer, I mean, I don't necessarily know the answer, but I think it's that it's finding that balance between how much risk am I willing to outsource and how much can I afford and how much am I willing to, to pay for that and if if you if you aren't willing to pay a huge amount over the odds you you then have to provide more guarantees I think that's okay. so we need to provide more guarantees in the SIBs to reduce the the, the maximum repayment uh, but it, it's a trade-off because you do that and then the whole argument around I'm transferring risk falls down so it, that's what I mean. It, it, it's, it's a blend. And you can't, you can't have it all. So I can't expect someone to take on all the risk without accepting that I'm going to pay for that. So I think this is a good thing to pick up probably towards yeah. the end of things, where we're trying to think through the sort of balance of uh, guaranteed versus risk capital. 
Final sort of clarifying question over here. Actually, we're, we're doing a, a presentation later in the panel where we're trying to address exactly that point, so we'd invite you to come and uh, <laughs> talk about that. So this is exactly, we're, we're here for that, actually. But my question was, you, you, I think you said that the ICRC uh, bond, compared to the others, attracted more private sector, or new, I would say, private sector uh, money. I would just be interested to know how, because, I mean, always the same question, if they're paying for that risk, at the end of the day, they could just go contract it to a service provider like insurance company saying, okay, we pay you for the risk that you're absorbing. So is it that new money or is it just paying a specific risk? So how, how compared to the other structures, actually the ICRC one attracted more, um, I would say, non-traditional grant because basically all these structures are grant-based at the end of the outcome funders are giving grants. So I just wanted to, 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 to understand the point. How, so, so how, how was it that that one attracted commercial investment and the others didn't? Oh, just commercial investment, specifically, because the others ha didn't have the others didn't have investors in it. They had investors, but they weren't com they they weren't pro it wasn't they weren't private sector investors. So they were donors. So, investing. so the investors in other structures weren't paid um, uh, weren't paid for the investment. Yeah, yeah. Well, the point I was making was, where is that money coming from? So is that private investment or is that donor money or foundations that probably would have gone into the development sector anyway, but through grants, but they're investing it instead versus is this commercial investment that would have gone into any industry and, okay. it, and it just so happened to this one? So is it, is it new money crowded into the development sector or is it money that was already there, but it's being reused? Okay. And in two of those is definitely money that um, is just being reused. One, it's a bit gray. Uh, and, and the ICRC, it's definitely new money. Because uh, Christian, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but th that money wouldn't have gone into the development sector if that instrument didn't exist. Great. So I'm conscious of time. We want to give Alison her shot. So I'll pass it over to you. And then we will open it back up for a lively discussion. Thank you. Well, good morning, and I'm delighted to be here to represent the Indian NGO Educate Girls and my colleagues Safina and Rishi. A lot of eyes have been on Educate Girls over the last four years. We were the first multi-year development impact bond to come into operation back in 2015 and then complete three years later, and the first ever impact bond, DIB or SIB, in school education. And I'm therefore guessing that a lot of you do already know our story, so I'll slightly gallop through the introduction as fast as I can. But what gets me into the office every day is Prachi. <laughs> um, she's a goat herder in remote rural Rajasthan, and she's one of over 4.1 million girls in India denied an education because of her gender. And the Educate Girls approach is to find and enroll every single one of those out-of-school girls in the locations where we work, and then work within the primary school to improve learning outcomes for both boys and girls alike. And this is the theory of change that our DIB was essentially based upon. We take a local community volunteer who works in his or her village to uh, change mindsets and behavior to enroll the girls and then deliver a remedial education program to improve quality within the school. And as James pointed out, there are a lot of different models, but we would see ourselves really as a very pure and simple dib as a proof of concept. And that's what we were aiming for. Um, and, and this was in terms of how it was structured. So we were, paying for, that we were paid for two very clear outcomes, enrollment of out-of-school girls and improvement in learning outcomes. We had one investor, one outcome funder, and the payment was based on the outcome results at the end of full three years of implementation. Now, we partnered with the government to access the schools and run a control evaluation, but they were not involved as a funder. And at one point, we were the largest impact bond in terms of population or service users, but the smallest in terms of funding for service delivery. Now, the reason for this panel is to start to look at some of the... Sorry. Ooh. Spoiling the fun. Um, the reason for this panel is to examine the evidence that we have so far and look at some of the claims that um, James and, and Emily have been laying out in their presentation. 
Um, the evidence is building for SIBs, but to date, we're still the only development impact bonds, the only multi-year development impact bonds, to complete and publish results. And we're now in one year after completing the contract, so we've had some time to reflect and ask and see what next. But it's still very nascent in terms of the evidence of completed impact bonds. We've certainly asked ourselves many of these questions that Emily and James have been discussing, and uh, both James's. <laughs> Um, and I think we do have clear answers for some. And as with both the other presentations, there's still a lot yet to be proven and that we don't know. But let's have a look at what we think we do know. We certainly experienced a real cultural shift in our organization, in how we work with donors, in how we implement, and we totally orientated towards outcomes. And it was exciting to work and collaborate with donors who were explicitly aligned around jointly agreed outcomes rather than activities and budget lines. And the big question, did this improve our eventual impact? Well, yes, it did. Uh, no surprise there. We all know the results. But our dip was a remarkable success in terms of outperforming our targets and genuinely deepening our impact. So I'd say that we know that many attributes of the dip can deepen impact and cause a significant improvement in performance. And what are those attributes? Well, flexible funding, a razor-sharp focus on results, a multi-year commitment, and improved performance management and monitoring, something that Stefan was talking about earlier. So we'll just look at the results again very quickly. Oh, too quickly. Sorry. Um, so after two years, we were definitely on track for enrollment, which was 20% uh, of, we of what we were paid upon. But there was a lot of importance placed on the learning gains in our contract. And had we carried on in this trajectory after two years, um, we would only have hit 78% of our target. So we really were pushing ourselves with how we set the targets. They were based on previous performance, but in a different geography. And we added a 10% stretch. So we generally struggled in the first two years, particularly with the learning. But the final results, oh, sorry. But the final results speak for themselves. Um, with the longer-term flexible capital, the pressure, I suppose, as well as the focus on results, and the right outcomes for the community, we did achieve better, so, better social outcomes for the children. More girls in school, more older girls in school who are notoriously hard to enroll, and vastly improved learning outcomes for children with a very, very poor baseline, and children where there were a lot of first-generation learners. So it was, it was a very strong result. Now, the reason for doing our DIB was not really to access more capital, and it was not to test an innovation or work with a new commissioner. It was to prepare for scale. We were determined to use a payment by results mechanism, whatever that might be, it ended up being a DIB, to ensure that we could deliver quality as we scaled. We were really mindful of the pressure, the amount of girls at not accessing an education in India, and we wanted to work at scale. But we were really clear that we wanted to offer the same quality to the first child in the programme as the one millionth girl in our programme. And so we thought that payment by results would be a good way to test this. Our DIB, however, was not at all at scale. It was about 5% of our budget and operations as we started. And by the end of the three years, it had dropped to around 2% as we grew. And although comparatively large in terms of the number of children, it, it couldn't be described as a scale contract. Looking back on it, it was perhaps more of an R&D phase for us. So I don't think our contract has, has at all proven that the DIB instrument itself can be taken to scale. However, did it do the job for us in terms of prepare us for scale? And the answer is a resounding yes. Um, so this is how we've grown. Um, we started back in 2007. The DIB came into play in uh, 2015. And um, even during the DIB implementation, we were gradually growing in confidence, uh, embedding some of the learning into programs in other geographies and really ramping up. And we now feel really set and really confident about our five-year growth plan, where we're hoping to reach 1.6 million girls by 2024. And now to adaptation and innovation. Now, we certainly feel that we enabled a lot of adaptive management and, in some cases, innovation through our DIB. 
But this was not solution innovation, as everyone's alluded to. It was really implementation innovation. We already had a tried and tested overall program model and a solution when we started. What we did experiment with were micro innovations, looking at a suite of interventions and tactics, seeing what combination worked best. We innovated at the doorstep. Our last mile field workers had the flexibility to be really reactive to ground realities and think on their feet. In the classroom, we had the flexibility to totally revamp our whole curriculum and teaching practice after year one. In the head office, we used new technology to improve performance management, and with that, push decisions much, much closer to the field. So as a result of this, we have improved how we use data, and we now have predictive capabilities through machine learning, something we introduced in the year after the DIB. We now identify hotspots of out-of-school girls, and we have this new curriculum, both of which we're taking to scale. And where our traditional approach of finding out-of-school girls would take us to, say, one million children by 2024, with this highly targeted approach and the way we're now using machine learning and data, we're going to reach an additional 600,000 girls with similar resources and time. So the jury is out in terms of new capital, and I don't think our contract did, um, did necessarily demonstrate that. Essentially, our funding came to us still as a grant and um, came from donors who were already used to giving in the field of education and gender. However, we can say that our enhanced credibility and what we achieved through the DIB has enabled us to raise more funding. Um, even before we'd finished the DIB contract, we raised a big match grant from Educate a Child initiative. Um, and then in the six months after the DIB, um, we became an audacious project. So essentially, we are well, well on our way to funding our five-year growth plan. And this is the first time we've had five-year funding commitments, which is a big change since the DIB. So we've taken performance management systems to 26,000 schools from the 166 in the DIB. Uh, we've taken the new curriculum to a quarter of a million children from the DIB 7,000 and raised this long-term capital. But there's a caveat here. Without a counterfactual, can we attribute Educate's Girls' success to the funding contract being um, structured as an impact bond? Can we attribute it to the external evaluation? Or was it just down to our program? And I don't think we know. And I would concur with ID Insight, our evaluator, who did make a strong case recently for some of the new outcome funds to look at a counterfactual um, and you know, grant funding alongside um, DIBs as, as we move forward in this field. So some concluding thoughts, rapid concluding <laughs> thoughts. We put a lot of the success down of our contract to how closely involved we as a service provider were involved in the design. The community needs to be put first, and we were at the table negotiating the design of the outcomes, the targets, and the measurements. So the power has to be in the right place with the accountability to the community members and not just the contract. Secondly, I think we've shown that a DIB can be suitable for improving learning outcomes in a government school setting, but we feel very strongly that straightforward grant funding will be more appropriate. For example, programs looking at improving girls' agency or negotiation skills, something that was not included in our contract. So softer outcomes, harder things to measure will not fare well under a DIB contract necessarily. And we're convinced that our contract was a successful proof of contract, uh, con concept but what's needed now is a nuanced conversation about how we can assure that in pursuit of innovative financing, we don't take funding away from social justice and human rights causes where a DIB may not be suitable. A DIB should be one of the tools in the box. And many of the criticisms of impact bonds did not play out in our contracts, such as perverse incentives. But essentially, all risk um, of inappropriate incentives or these small, expensive, complex, bespoke contracts... This we can mitigate with the instrument being used um, for outcomes that are aligned with national government priorities or, in the absence, the SDGs, and with the use of common measurement frameworks. And the outcomes need to be set locally. Educate Girls in India, we wouldn't be able to set outcome targets, pricing, um, setting the right outcomes for children in, say, Palo Alto or in Birmingham. You know, we have no understanding of the context of the children. So similarly, we need to be at the table setting the targets and measures for girls in tribal communities in rural India. And I think if you take one thing away from our presentation, um, 
that's it, that we can overcome a lot of the risks and critiques of DIBs if we align the outcomes with national government priorities, SDGs, and have common measurement frameworks. Because this should protect the community, put their needs first, enable scale, which I think is incredibly important, and lives change for the better. So this is still a new but promising financial tool. It should be explored more as we try to plug the vast gap to fund the SDGs. And for us, uh, for us, it's certainly been a fantastic foundation as we build on our work and try to improve the lives for many more girls like Prachi. Thank you. Any quick questions for Alison? <laughs> Sorry, Alison. Me and I want to ask you one question. If you would have received unrestricted grant funding, unrestricted grant funding over three years with a razor sharp focus on outcomes with the support of performance management without the dip, do you think you would have achieved the same results? I mean, it's a question we're always asking ourselves, and I think it's really, really hard to say because I think, you know, this, this focus on the results, the performance management, yes, if we'd had those, potentially. But there was, going back to the reputation risk, there was a huge reputation risk for us around this contract. You know, all eyes were on us. There was that pressure. Was that the dip? Was that, you know, these other elements? I think it's very hard to tell. We don't have that counterfactual, so we don't know. <laughs> Clarifying questions? Go for it. In governance of our World Bank. So can I uh, ask you, very impressive growth going forward. How much of that will be using the impact bond approach, if any? None at the moment. So yes, we've, the, the raise that we've done this last year has been grant funding. But we've learned a lot and structured a lot of our work with a very clear outcomes fo focus. So we now talk about a payment per outcome rather than an activity. We have a very different way of structuring our budgets. So a lot of that has passed over into our grant funding now. But at the moment, um, we're not looking at another impact bond, and that's not what we've raised to date. Do you want to rejoin yes, here? Um, please. So what I'll do is take a couple questions at a time from different parts of the room. Um, I'm inclined to start over here. Does anyone have any questions for the panel? Yes, uh, there's a mic coming right behind you. Yeah, question for Alison. Uh, would you mind telling us why you haven't gone for another dip? I can tell you that, yeah. I mean, for us, coming out of such a, such a high profile, such, a, such a, a, you know, a hard work but really rewarding contract, we felt that was, to some degree, a sort of one-time pivot at the time. Um, that everything we'd learned, as I said, it was a very, very small contract compared to the rest of our work. So we needed to spend and focus the next year on taking that to scale because we felt that we had made such valuable learnings that they shouldn't just be ring-fenced to a small, you know, DIB plus RT, RCT type contract. So that's what we've been focusing on over the next year, uh, over, this, over this last year. And I mean, we haven't yet uh, sort of considered an impact bond um, with, that's fully aligned to everything that we have in place in terms of the outcomes that we're currently working on, that we've designed for, and the whole structure of our organisation and our curriculum and how we measure is all built around a particular framework. And yes, if another social impact bond was offered to us um, fully aligned with our work, we'd be very interested in that. But at the moment, that hasn't been the case. Cool. Anyone else over here? Um, hello, Zoya Siddiqui from BRAC. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, one way of looking at scale could be to go through government. Um, did Educate Girls ever consider maybe going to government and looking um, to them, either the ministry in Rajasthan for outcome payments, or would that be a consideration at some point? I mean, that's something. Sorry, can I talk with this you. microphone? Yeah, I think I'm mic, so I think it's fine. I think I might say it's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we see the sort of trajectory from a dib to a sib as a very important one. And um, we are constantly being asked advice by various government ministers. We're involved in various committees, talking to people like the Niti Aayog, who are one of the bodies in India who are taking quite seriously the idea of social impact bonds. 
and it's something that we most certainly would consider. I mean, for us, I think what I was saying earlier about how we can see the future of these contracts is aligning with national priorities. And so we've been working hard to, we work within the government school system, we're augmenting the curriculum that the government's working on. So systemic change is very much something that we would be looking to in the longer term. Can I invite questions here? I saw Chi and then we'll go to you. Uh, Chi Hung Sin from Traverse. So this could sound like a question for Alison, but actually anyone from the panel would be very welcome to answer. I think the, the point you just made about aligning it with national priorities and common outcomes framework, I could see the reason for that in terms of reducing the barriers for getting an impact bond going. But how do you think that sits in, say, uh, a context like the UK or even in Japan where uh, the, 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 the national government priorities could be very much skewed to something like cost savings. So the blend of outcomes they're willing to pay for and what they want to structure an impact bond to do could be chasing a very small set of those kinds of system-based savings, financial outcomes. How would that sit in terms of that balance and tension with what we're talking about through the different speakers about wider social outcomes? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think my comment was very much related to um, working in an international development context and rather than having lots of smaller bespoke contracts where the outcomes are not necessarily aligned, you know, there I think it's very important to look to some commonalities so we can start to look at scale and align with governments or with, say, the SDGs because then beneath that you've got these common frameworks. But I don't think I'm in a good position necessarily yeah, to, to ask, answer does anyone else that. have a comment? in terms of the alignment of um, the sort of natural goals with what's actually happening within projects? I could respond on that one. I mean, clearly, I can't remember who it was that said, but I mean, clearly there, so t let's just take education sector, for example. Um, you know, there, there may be very concrete education outcomes that we want to see around literacy and numeracy, um, which may be the government priority, but um, you know, the global education sector also recognizes the importance of 21st century skills, um, you know, and so, you know, I, the question then comes is, you know, who's, who's making the decision about what it is that's the most important, what should we be measuring, and obviously some, there are certain things that are <clears throat> harder to measure and may in fact be more difficult in an impact bond context, which is the point that Alison made, I guess. So, you know, I think it's, it's a balance, I think, uh, for sort of the sustainability and buy-in and thinking about sort of, yeah, the long term, um, having those government priorities and, you know, having governments at the table. And I think, like, for example, EOF, um, Middle East and Africa has been really focused on, you know, trying to, um, you know, having those conversations with government, understanding their priorities. Um, but yeah, again, I mean, it's, it's, it's finding that balance, I think, and, and, and what's possible. And yeah, and being really careful that not, um, that, that the very important things that, um, you know, aren't sort of left behind. And I saw a hand here. My question is quite broad, and it's to all of you. And it is: Have we lost sight of the ethos of what impact bonds are and what they started out as? And I, I ask that because, um, James, you pointed out that we've we, we've we've need to have a better understanding of how things have changed, and that there's some you know, value that has been lost, and whether we should be scaling back. But then also, Alison, you mentioned the fact that we should be accountable to our communities. And when we're scaling up, we kind of remove ourselves, we become more, more distant to that grassroots level and, and to the providers and to the local communities that we're working with. And the fact that in the UK in particular, social impact bonds have been uh, um, arose out of response to the, 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 the 2008 crash, where there was a reduction in public services and a lot of them are in response to that kind of grassroots perspective and a lot of the activities that took place without social impact bonds and because of social impact bonds have been with communities working together um, to come up with solutions to address those gaps in, in gap, those gaps in provision so in terms of also then kind of identifying the risk and i'm thinking quite broadly here, um, that risk management and why local authorities who are predominantly political, as in the same way as a minister would be political, you know, the um, city councillors get voted in in a similar kind of way, why, they would take their, why would they take on that risk and how would they manage that? So do we need to start asking more, more questions about their motivations and, and about 
how do we return to that ethos? And if that ethos is, has, have we moved away from that now? And are we talking about something new and different? Yeah, that feels like a good question for maybe James or James in terms of, um, <laughs> I'll let you fight amongst yourselves, but. James number one. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. And as you, I was just starting, as you were saying that, I was like, well, what was the original ethos? And I'm not sure anybody really could even say that. I think, and actually maybe you are better answering this, but I'll have a go first. Um, I think what's happened is they were, there, there probably was an ethos or a vision around this perfect world of we pay for outcomes, we know they happened, we only pay when they happen, and the savings from those pay for the, the payments themselves, and we've got this wonderful virtual circle, and, and everything's great. And I think what we often describe in our evaluations is this like SIM hype curve of at the beginning, they were the panacea and they were going to solve all our problems and they were going to perfectly pay for themselves, aren't they wonderful? And then we had this sort of, I think it's called the sort of, Oh, what is it called? There's like this massive drop where you suddenly, this despair, where you think, oh my gosh, these things are awful and they don't work and they're really expensive and we can't measure outcomes. And then you get what's called the plateau of productivity, which is where um, actually you start to make compromises and you think, okay, I could do this here. Yeah, uh, I could get savings here, but I couldn't get savings here, but actually I do want to do it because of innovation. So I think, how, I'm not, I don't think we've lost the ethos. I think what we've done is we've realized we've got o over the hype and we've realized that they aren't this perfect model that's going to do all these things, but they can be applied in different ways. My fear, which maybe does answer your question, is that a series of compromises have therefore been made. And, in, and I'd probably get shot down by many people in this room, but my, my view is that one of the biggest compromises, which I'm most uncomfortable with, maybe as an evaluator, is, is the impact side. And if you look at what Peterborough Prism was, and it was a you know, very, very robust measurement of impact and, and outcomes, and we're moving away from paying for outcomes, and we're moving away from robust measurement, and we've got proxy self, and, you know, and it's watering, watering down. And are we paying for outcomes? And do we actually know what works if we're not measuring it properly? So that is the one bit where I think we maybe have lost. The other bit, I think, is just about uh, amending it to actually what works in reality rather than the sort of vision at the beginning. That's my take. Yeah, I mean, I agree with with most of the things that you said. I mean, I think what's interesting about SIBs is that there are these kinds of internal tensions and contradictions. Um, so looking at the UK context, they were obviously introduced largely around austerity and as a means for central government to try and reduce um, expenditures at the local level uh, to influence the way that local authorities kind of behave and, and, and go about their work. And yet at the same time, in order to introduce this kind of a model, you need fundamentally need capacity within local government. So at the same time as that capacity is kind of being cut, I remember one person talking about how um, there was some interest in doing a SIB with one local authority, but the people who would have done that work um, had, had left because of funding cuts. So it's that kind of very real kind of tension around um, cutting back in terms of capacity and yet capacity within government being required in order to make the model work. Um, and that I think has played out in a number of different contexts um, as well. You can look at the US um, where cities are facing incredible amount of pressure um, around, around budgets and, and around funding and have had kind of an interest in developing pay for success projects, but there the challenge has been in engaging um, state level government um, especially. Um, and there's been a number of, of projects which haven't moved forward because of the difficulty engaging. So kind of contradictions between different levels of government um, and objectives underlying driving what it is that we're trying to accomplish, I think have, have been a, an important constraint. Great, so I'm aware that we are between you all and lunch. So I will suggest that you all get first dibs for asking these folks questions out in the forum. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for your attention and time and good questions.